You're listening to The Minimalist Podcast with Joshua Fields Milburn and TK Coleman. Thank you, Alabama. Hello, everybody. Nicodemus is in Montana and TK is out sick this week. I didn't want him coughing on the microphones. He was coughing a lot, but don't worry. He'll be back next week. And don't worry because we have a very special guest for this episode. Today on the show, we are joined by our returning champion, Dr. Nicole LaPera. She's a brilliant woman who trained in clinical psychology at Cornell. Dr. LaPera is a holistic psychologist and she's the author of a brand new book, How to Be the Love You Seek, Break Cycles, Find Peace, and Heal Your Relationships. Coming up on this free public minimal episode, a caller has a question about healing her long-term relationship with her husband, and another listener has a question about learning to trust again after a series of toxic relationships. Then we've got our lightning round segment and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full maximal edition of episode 434. That's the whole episode, y'all, with Dr. Nicole Lapera, where we answer five times the questions and we dive deep into several simple living segments. That's over on Patreon, private podcast. You can check it out now, patreon.com slash the minimalist. Your support keeps our podcast 100% advertisement free because sing along at home, y'all. Advertisements, Advertisements suck. suck. Let's start with our callers. If you have a question or a comment for our show, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call, 406-219-7839, or email a voice recording to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Kristen. Hi, everyone. This is Kristen. I'm a longtime listener and recent Patreon subscriber from Connecticut. I think the universe sometimes points us to things that they want us to see, so... You know, I've listened to the Pain of Clinging episode several times, probably five or six times, and just put it together the other day that it was released on, you know, kind of the day that I feel like my world shifted. So it just in reading into that, I think it causes me to look at that a little bit differently and say, okay, are there things that I'm clinging to related to that? And, you know, this kind of life shift was related to my husband of 17 years. Um, we are still married very committed to each other. I think we have a stronger relationship now than we did at that point, simply because we're really communicating on a much different level now, which is really great. So I know in my heart that I'm not clinging to that relationship. I do know that I'm clinging to pieces, right? Of I think part of it is clinging to what I thought the relationship was or what I, you know, how I viewed it, but also clinging to maybe some guilt with missing where it went left. So really trying now to be present in this relationship without going back to thinking about what I missed or how I missed it or worrying that I'm going to miss it again. I know you're not going to give me advice because that's not what we do here. But I do think any input or guidance would be really appreciated. I recorded this like six or seven times trying to not get tears or the F word. (laughs) So we made it without a well-placed F word, but we did not make it without tears. Um, Anyway, I appreciate what you guys do. You really bring a lot of value and I would love to get your thoughts. Thanks so much. Where do we start with Kristen's question here? Because there's a lot of emotion there. She's obviously... She's injecting a little bit of levity because it's so heavy, right? And there's a lack of peace here. There's uh, the word she brings up is guilt. And I imagine she's dragging a lot of past into the present and it's probably tainting what's going on right now. And so she's experiencing these unpleasant emotions. And, and those unpleasant emotions are often this indicator of an incongruity between reality and the way you wish things were. Let's start there. Yeah, I picked up on um, her even using the word expectation, right? And I think a lot of times when we create those, I first want to celebrate Kristen for the awareness of the fact that she's able to call in and say, hey, I do have these expectations. I do have this feeling of guilt because for a lot of us, we're so even disconnected from what's going on in our internal world, creating expectations that then when there is that disconnect from reality causes us the suffering. And a lot of us are then even really disconnected from 
how we feel. But I think her question really illustrates a lot of what my work and this newest book is about, all of the different ways that we bring the past, whether it's the past in our childhood or whether it's the past in our current relationship into our present moment that continues to color it with expectations or ultimately a disconnect where we're not really here with what is as opposed to we're living in our mind with what we wish to be or maybe even fear to be. (laughs) Yeah, the wish part is interesting because whenever you wish for something that doesn't map onto reality, it disrupts your peace. So in a way, peace is an absence of wishing for things Mm -hmm. that don't exist or can't exist, right? I wish I would have done something differently. Okay, I understand that. But carrying that forward then is a great recipe to disrupt your peace. And the subtitle of your book, you talk about finding peace. So let's talk to Kristen specifically because she's in a relationship now. She's trying to heal that relationship. But I think ultimately she's trying to find peace within the relationship. Yeah, and I think when we think about peace, I think sometimes we have the expectation that peace is the absent of any other emotion. And I can make a case as I do in my book that peace is really a groundedness in presence, which sometimes means I'm at peace and present to negative, to upsetting emotions, to grief, to shifts, to changes. I mean, if something did shift in the dynamic in her relationship, then there's a transition. And with transition, I think sometimes a lot of us don't expect that there is a grieving process, right? The dynamic is different. Maybe my identity is different. Who I knew myself to be in this relationship might be different. Who I expected my partner, here's another expectation, to be might be different. So again, I think peace is one of those tricky emotions in a sense or states of being, I should say, because it doesn't mean to the exclusion of of upset, Mm. of grief. And I think that's the hardest part sometimes because that becomes then the expectation that we put on ourselves that I shouldn't feel upset. I shouldn't be mourning something that is structurally different and then ultimately what that means for me and the relationship. And then you're heaping on more expectations on top of the upset, which then increases the upset. It increases the stress, the discontent. However, I I would say that it does seem to me that peace is often related to an absence of clinging to those emotions. It may not be the absence of emotion. You can have peace even amid the grief But when we cling, and I think that's quite often these tears that we hear in Kristen's voice, the tears are almost this byproduct of letting go after an extended period of of clinging. Can you maybe talk to Kristen about the way in which we cling to emotions that disrupt the peace in a relationship? Yeah, and I think for some of us, I mean, the way in which we relate, let me even just go even as macro as possible, So much of how we relate in our relationships, whether it's the emotionality, what we're showing, what we're expressing, how we're showing up in terms of our perspective, our self-expression is so colored by our earliest experiences. So if in childhood we didn't have a secure, grounded, emotionally attuned caregiver that quite literally through co-regulation, through this human and their grounded, calm state of presence was able to show up when we were upset. We were crying as an infant and our body was dysregulated and then help us physiologically release that emotion, let it go, have the experience, the natural experience of emotions as being emotional energies, physiological experiences in my body that B, do go away. But what we don't have, we don't literally teach our body how to process our emotion, then a large majority of us characterologically are stuck Mm -hmm. in emotion, some of which that we're bringing from childhood. And I think this touches into, because something that I heard in her question and in her worry or concern is around this idea of missing something. Mm -hmm. And what's coming to mind for me, I think this elusive space of intuition that so many of us are searching for. How do I know? How do I, how will I know when something's right for me, wrong for me? Where do I look for guidance? And I think a lot of us have learned and been taught to look outside of ourselves. We do. We, we hang everything on finding this one sign to then know what to do and how to interpret it and know how to make the choice that's best for me in the future, not realizing that intuition is actually an, in, an internal a monitor, guidance, compass of sorts. And it really does connect to our ability to not only feel, to be with in presence and to process our emotions. 
because emotions have incredible value. They're markers. They give us information. And when we don't have that ability to be resilient, taught to us in childhood, then we do look outside of ourselves, And we do have that worry that I'm hearing in Kristen's voice that someone has some information that if I miss it, I might make the wrong choice. When in reality, I think it really is this practice of learning how to turn inward for our own senses and learning then ultimately how to trust them. Yeah, that problem with information clutter becomes, uh, it actually often makes the problem worse. Whenever we're making a big life decision or we're in a case like Kristen and we're trying to understand our situation, it's easy to make an intellectual pro and con list Mm -hmm that doesn't account for any of that intuition that you're talking about. And I can game the system and have all the correct information down on paper, but it doesn't really capture what's going on inside me. It usually captures those externalities. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. And I think, again, when we don't have that self-trust, it becomes not only our attempt at clarity, like you're beautifully describing, like I need to assess very logically, Sometimes I even think it becomes a protection against, right? If I Mm. look for something outside of me to give me the answer, what am I not doing? I'm not looking inward. I'm not feeling all of the dysregulating, upsetting emotions that are still living in my body. Because again, to be able to attune to my emotions means that I have to be, have that resilience to be present and responsive when I'm upset so that I can then make decisions based on what that emotion ultimately is telling me. So in the book, you talk about breaking cycles. And I think that's where Kristen is. She wants to break the cycle of rumination, about telling herself a story about why things are imperfect or incomplete, right? So maybe you could talk to Kristen a bit about breaking the cycle so she can actually be in the relationship as opposed to try to do or fix the relationship. I want to go back to the kind of celebratory moment when I acknowledge the awareness. Because to be present, we first have to notice all of the different places that our attention gets distracted throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So in each and every moment, Kristen, and really any other listener, if we do notice within ourselves a tendency to either assess external kind of bases of information or to distract ourselves in thought, and even I think with so much information, going back to this idea of information overload, some of us think we're very well intentionally reading all the self-help books, right? Finding all the new Instagram accounts with all the new information. And we think we're doing it to serve ourselves, right? To use this insight to then translate it into presence and awareness and ultimately shifting and changing. But I can make a case at any moment, and many of us spend all of our moments in our mind, that for a lot of us gives us that distance from the emotions in my body. So meaning really simply, Kristen, any other listeners, each and every time you do notice that external distractions or even that internal distraction of rumination, celebrating that. Because in that moment of awareness, we gift ourselves with the most empowering choice we could make. Because we are the being that gets to choose, do we continue to ruminate? Do we continue to have the expectation, tell ourselves the story, fantasize about a future that's maybe not the reality? Or in that moment of choice, do we say, okay, You know, I understand why I'm ruminating in this moment. Let me unhook that focus of attention and let me begin to refocus it, reconnecting with my body. So in each and every moment, again, it can become a consistent practice because those ruminating thoughts will be present in the next moment, but unhooking and maybe it's your breath as an anchor. Maybe it's just the feeling of your grounded presence, whether you're sitting and standing, just feeling the weight on your heels, your back and your body supported by the furniture beneath you. Any moment you can shift back to your body is a shift into that present awareness, which I believe is so incredibly important because now I'm connected to where those emotions are, right? Now I can learn how to be more responsive when I'm having them. You reminded me of Carlos Castaneda. He talks about removing or letting go of your past personal history, which is perhaps the most difficult thing for us to do because our identity is so tied up in essentially our resume. It could be our relationship resume. It could be our workplace resume. It could be my high school sports resume. Whatever resume that you have, the list of accomplishments 
that's not who you are now. Those are things that happened in the past. And one of the most difficult things to let go of isn't a material possession. And it's not even a relationship. It's the story I tell myself about who I am based on these facts from the past. And what Castaneda is getting at there, I think, is as soon as we realize that our personal history is not who we are right now, and you could say that about Kristen's relationship, the history of your 17-year relationship with your husband, the past does not equal the present, nor does it equal the future. And as soon as you realize that, you can break the cycle of reliving and relitigating the things that happened before right now. And I think the most important part of that is that acknowledgement. Right, that exact acknowledgement that there is a recreation or a reliving that that is that is happening in actuality. Because I think a lot of us we do disconnect and distance ourselves from the past, and then ultimately the part we're playing, the part that the past has created. And what's I think particularly important to emphasize is this is another one of those areas where, at least in my opinion, speaking holistically, when we're talking about showing up differently, we are talking about showing up differently in an an embodied state, right? It's not just about knowing the narration of our past and reframing it or telling ourselves a different story. It's actually physiologically teaching ourselves, sometimes even our body, increasing our body's ability to tolerate stress and upsetting emotions so that we can make the choice to show up differently. And that I think is the hardest piece because the reality is our beliefs are grounded in our lived experience, in one way at one time that we felt to be true. So these identities that you're very beautifully describing, Joshua, are so ingrained. And some of us, and I think this is a shameful aspect of it, as we increase in biological age, we feel even more shameful if and when we do come to this realization that we don't actually know who we are because all we've known is the role that we've had to play and the sense of worth or value that we've tried to kind of gather from that role. And that's, I think, why so many of us continue to feel not only confused, unfulfilled, because the roles that many of us are playing aren't honoring our wants, our needs, our true self-expression. So when we continue to play the role to try to meet that need, I mean, we do literally continue then just to spin our cycles and our wheels, cycling through things that aren't serving us. That's spot on. Kristen, I'd love to give you one more resource as well. TK just released a free ebook. It's called Emotional Clutter. You can download it for free on the Minimalist website, theminimalists.com slash emotional clutter. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. If you want the audiobook version, I'd be happy to send that to you too, Kristen, because TK did such a beautiful job outlining what causes this emotional clutter and not making the emotions that we feel bad or demonic. It's <laughs> that they are something we experience and we really get into trouble when we keep clinging to those emotions because we don't have the awareness that Nicole is talking about here. So emotional clutter, I think you'll enjoy that. I'll also put a link to how to be the love you seek in the show notes as well. Our next question is from Shy. Hi, I'm Shy. I live in the UK and I'm a Patreon subscriber. I've recognised that I'm the common factor in all my toxic failed relationships. Now single at 40, I find myself withdrawing, seeing hostility and distrust everywhere, even in myself. This is a projection I realised tied to a deep-seated self-loathing for past mistakes. Since our relationship with ourselves underpins all others, How can I begin to heal this breach within myself? Thank you for answering my question. So Nicole Shy brings up a good point here because quite often what happens when you notice the imperfections in others, you're merely looking at a mirror about yourself. I don't like this about that person. And sometimes that's because I see that version of me. I see the ugliest version of me in other people. And it's so much easier to see it in you than it is to actually look in that mirror. So it's almost a gift when someone holds up a mirror of the things I don't like about myself. But I was fascinated by the question here. So she's 40 and single. And now she's saying, I am the common factor in the toxic relationship. So another celebration here and that awareness, right? But what observations do you have for Shy? 
I'm really picking up on the specific words. Um, I think I heard Shai say hostility, maybe even distress everywhere. And the reason I note that when our body is in an activated nervous system response, meaning simply we've perceived a stress or a threat somewhere, and now our nervous system, our physiology is getting involved, when it happens in an acute moment or when some of us, as I mentioned earlier, are living kind of chronically stuck in that overstressed, overwhelmed, under-resourced system where our nervous system can't kind of go back into that peace and that calm, there have been significant studies now that have measured individuals who are kind of stuck in what I call survival mode, a nervous system response. And these studies have studied individuals in the context of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, CPTSD, where as a result of early relational trauma, individuals sometimes do stay stuck in a trauma response or in survival mode, as I'll call it. And what this research showed, and I think it's really powerful here, when our nervous system is activated, even when being flashed neutral images on a screen that they've you know measured and assessed to be neutral images, individuals with an activated nervous system will perceive threat, even when threat is objectively not measurably present in the image. And the reason why I'm bringing that up and hearing self-loathing, right, to me, I'm wondering, again, not knowing details of the childhood experience that Shai might have had, but to me, it sounds like there might be trauma stored in the body-mind that's creating this filter of quite literally seeing hostility and distress everywhere. Not only a projection, I think, like you're describing, which is the case, a projection of our lack of safety, right? So now we're literally projecting that on faces, on experiences, on interactions. And I want to say that because I really do want to normalize when someone like Shai is saying, I see hostility everywhere. I'm afraid. I'm reacting from this fear-based place. That's so physiologically real. The physiology of fear, the perception of fear, and then ultimately the reactivity, probably that was a learned adaptation in childhood, is very, this is what I was meaning when I said the kind of holistic approach, right? Knowing that insightfully is part of the story, but for someone like Shy, really then structurally, foundationally, building safety back into the body, teaching our body how to go from survival mode to a calm, grounded state of presence. Otherwise, that filter will continue to be placed over our experiences. I think this is where we confuse ourselves sometimes because our body is sending so much messages to our mind. We can't think straight if we're, our body is stressed. We can't think clearly. We will think negative, stressful thoughts when that's what our body is telling our mind. Let's talk about breaking the cycle here. Have you seen people who are in Shai's similar, a similar case to Shy, where they've gotten to a point in their life where they want to break that cycle and they're finally opened up to that awareness. Have you seen some people that have broken the cycle? What do they look like on the other side of it? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm always a proponent of the reality, again, scientifically validated, that change can happen at any time. It absolutely does begin with that awareness. And I even want to maybe complicate the awareness piece too. Awareness isn't just, oh, this is my habit, my pattern. Oh, I've had trauma, right? Very logically distance in my past. And now this is what, what is happening. Awareness in this moment even goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, aware of the emotional fallout of what happened or didn't happen in childhood, right? It's not just to be aware of the dynamics or the lack. It's to say, am I emotionally aware? Can I be present to whether or not the circumstance was, you know, active physical neglect or physical abuse, or maybe it was emotional neglect. Can I be present to the grief and loss and maybe anger that mm. was a natural byproduct of not having had those needs met early in childhood? Because all of those suppressed emotions for a lot of us is part of the reason our nervous system is still dysregulated because our body is still overwhelmed. So becoming present, I think, is more complicated than just knowing our story. It's actually allowing ourselves to feel the grief and the emotions that come up very understandably and naturally as a byproduct of what happened to us. But quite often we hold on to the the grief and maybe sometimes even use it as a weapon against the people that we care about most. So if I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling angry, those emotions aren't wrong and they're not bad. 
but when they become a weapon with which I batter the people around me, it actually doesn't break the cycle. In fact, it just continues the cycle or amplifies the cycle, makes things much worse. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think a lot of times, well, two things happen. We either batter or kind of project the emotion we're feeling kind of outwardly because we don't have the resources to to be with it, to contain it, to kind of process it anywhere else. We literally, once our nervous system becomes activated, we become overwhelmed and we start saying and doing the hurtful things that we don't mean, right? Because that's where that emotional energy is coming out. I think a second reason is because somewhere subconsciously or maybe even consciously, we believe the person or the event to be the cause of our emotions. Yes. And for me, that was a big significant shift because I walked through the world imagining, even directly telling people that they were, their actions or inactions were absolutely the cause of how I felt. Blaming. Blaming. Because again, two things happen. In childhood, right, not only did I observe and have experience, right, with a mother who, because she couldn't contain her own emotions, kind of took that approach at kind of reflecting outward, I would hear very directly from that mom oftentimes, oh, don't do this or I'll feel. Or can't you do that and make me feel, right? Mm. Really kind of connecting this idea that I am the cause, the choices I make, the thoughts I express, the way I am in the world is the cause of another's emotions. So I carry that belief with me, projecting that everyone else caused me to feel. And it's really natural because all of this subconscious world that I'm talking about, right? This mental narrative that we're assigning, these physiologies happening in my body that's communicating with this mental narrative and these habitual reactions all wired into my neurobiology is all happening outside my awareness. So of course it's natural. We tune in when the thing happened and we're already overwhelmed with the emotion. So it's really common to say, oh, this caused me to feel this way until we understand, again, emotions. And I talk about this in the book. We are even a creative participant, our past in particular, in terms of our emotional experiences. Because it is the past, the emotions that were present, the physiology present in our past, the narratives that we assign to that physiology that will determine how we feel now. It is quite literally the way my body shifts in perception of what's happening, the, the narrative, probably a repeated one that my mind's assigned to every similar experience. Then I'm having the emotion. I think this is why oftentimes, and this happens a lot of times in families, siblings live the same exact experience and take away a completely different emotion, belief, and even narrative of what it is that happened. Because emotions, again, aren't objective realities. Our subconscious world is playing a much greater role in creating our emotional experiences, I think, than any of us even realize. The worst version of myself can see that you made me angry, you made me upset, or I would even say that you made me happy. Mm -hmm. But the best version of me would recognize that it's not in your power to make me angry. It's not in your power to make me upset. It's not in your power to make me feel guilty. It's not in your power unless I hand that power to you. Here you go. I'm allowing you to make me angry. But then as soon as I have that awareness, what happens? Well, then I'm taking responsibility for my own emotions. And it's not to make the emotions bad. It's to recognize that the externalities don't cause them nearly as much as my internal story, my internal state. And it's possible for one person to be completely outraged about a news or media event and a second person to be elated and so happy with the same exact event. So you can tell just from that alone that an external event isn't necessarily going to make you feel anger. It's not going to make you feel joy. You are going to make yourself feel those things based on the story you're telling yourself about those events. And I think that's how we create the possibility of, of true emotional resilience. Right. Again, this goes back to this idea of intuition comes from within. So does our ability to be emotionally resilient, because if it is indeed the world around us and what does that create a situation where we have to frantically continue to rearrange the world around us so that we don't feel 
a particular way instead of saying, okay, well, the world around us is outside of my control in a large extent. People, other people, individuals, as much as I would love to think I can control them, completely outside of my control. Though the empowering shift is, okay, well, what can I control? Me and how I navigate the world. So when I set myself up, I think with that reframe and that shift, then I put myself absolutely in the empowering position because I think we can get ourselves in trouble. And I see this a lot in very well-meaning families of parent with parents who, you know, come from a childhood and maybe some even directly affirm and commit, I am not going to recreate, right, this experience. I don't want my children to suffer in the same way that I did. Mm. So sometimes from that very well-intentioned place, what happens? Kind of bubbles get put around, right? We become hyper-focused on removing any possible stress or upset from our children's life so that they don't have to suffer in the way that we did. We make them a bubble child. Yes. And I could make a case that while very well-intentioned, that still creates a complicated issue possibly for that child who over time might lack resilience, might not feel empowered, might even feel on the more ex- extreme side of things, helpless and reliant and dependent or codependent on someone or something else to create the emotional climate that I want to feel within. And then we're exhausting ourselves and expending energy and something that's a near possibility. So again, I think the empowerment happens when we say, yes, the world will always be stressful. Navigating relationships, even just interactions with different unique individuals will always be stressful. It's not, can we avoid stress or create a utopian situation where no one is stressed or there's always peace? No, absolutely not. But we can equip ourselves to navigate the emotional world around us because again, emotions are what makes this human experience vibrant, alive. It's why we're here doing this. I love what you're saying about control. Paradoxically, one of the great ways to regain control is to let go of the need to control the externalities and then control what you can control inside here. Alabama, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalists on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X, and Threads. We are at The Minimalists on those platforms. Now, during the lightning round, Nicole, we each have 60 seconds to answer your questions with a short, <laughs> shareable, less than 140 character response. We call them minimal maxims. Uh, we put them in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast so people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media. But really, we can just maunder on a bit. And <laughs> Professor Sean makes them look pithy and beautiful in the show notes. In fact, he puts them all on a website called minimalmaxims.com where you can find all of our pithy pithy aphorisms from time to time. A lot of people make it sort of their desktop. As soon as they open up their their uh, browser, it's the first thing they see is some sort of simple quote from the minimalists. And then you can just refresh and get a new quote. Today's question is from 50 and fabulous. Even though I know I have everything that I need, I still don't feel like I am enough. How do I get over this feeling? So I want to start this by saying something that TK sent me before he called in sick and he was coughing like crazy. But he said, worthiness isn't the finish line. It is the starting point. And this person here, 50 and fabulous, is saying, look, I already have everything I need, but I don't have enough. It's that disease of needing more, the disease of feeling incomplete. How do I get over this. So I do want to talk about that a bit. Do you have anything relatively pithy for us, Nicole? Uh, I think worthiness is something that's so universal. Um, Lack of worthiness, I should say, because in that childhood, when we didn't, the large majority of us have whatever version of needs that went unmet, the only way we were able to understand it, lacking the developmental maturity, like you and I have now to zoom out and talk about all these nuanced reasons that cause people to do like cycles in the nervous system and the body and all of this great stuff. We are what is called egocentric. The whole world revolves around us. And the only way that we can understand what is happening is a byproduct of us in some way. So when needs go unmet in childhood really simply, the way universally that typically our minds make sense of it is something is intrinsically wrong about me. Now, some of us get information. Mm. Oh, stop crying. You're too dramatic. Toughen up, right? We have directives now around that which is wrong with me And then I believe that to be true because I'm dependent on this person. I adapt to keep this life-sustaining 
connection available, whatever it was, I assume the responsibility. So I change. I'd be a little less of the thing that's problematic for the person in front of me. And at our core, then we continue to believe how unworthy we are, behaving in the same way, suppressing all of these other aspects of our being. And I love this idea of it's the start point because Mm -hmm. a lot of people wait to feel worthy to action in worthy behaviors. And it's almost the complete opposite. Yes, Worthiness comes from beliefs that were validated in an environment where inaccurate things were told to us or ingrained in us. And the goal or the work, I should say, is to act in worthiness before we believe it to be true. I never look at a baby and say, that baby's unworthy of Mm -hmm. my love. You were born complete. You will die complete. And the only thing that will incomplete you in between are the stories that you adopt Mm -hmm. about your inadequacies. And so if you tell yourself inadequate, you're right. But if you tell yourself you're whole and complete, you're right, because you incomplete yourself through the stories that you tell yourself. If you want all of these pithy, minimal maxims in your inbox every Monday, we'll send you our email newsletter. Sign up for that at theminimalists.email. We'll never send you spam or junk or advertisements, but we will send you the show notes to every episode. And we'll start your week off with a little bit of simplicity four or five or 10 minimal maxims, some pithy sayings that you can carry with you throughout the week. Real quick for right here, right now, we're going to answer another question, actually a few more questions here in a moment. But first, uh, right here, right now, one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist, Nicole, we've been on tour this year. We're doing a brand new tour. It's called the Everything Tour. Uh, We're doing seven stops all across California. You can join us. Uh, the last one, Nicodemus was there, TK, and I was there. The rest of our team, Alabama's there, Professor Sean, Danny. And um, it's called the Everything Tour because it's the 10-year celebration of our second book, Everything That Remains. You can come on out. They're free. It's our first free tour since 2015. You can get tickets for the events that still have tickets over at theminimalists.com slash tour. You can tell your friends and family, bring someone who's never heard of minimalism. We're going to be in Orange County, Palm Springs, Ventura, Los Angeles, Fresno, San Diego, and San Francisco. Indie bookstores only, although some of these bookstores we've outgrown, so we're still partnering with the indie bookstores, but they're bringing us to some some bigger theaters so that we can uh, reach you with this less this message of less. The tickets are free over at theminimalists.com. Come to multiple events if you want. Each one is appreciably different. Alabama, what else you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hi, my name is Susanna. I'm currently in Marietta, Georgia. I am calling in response to Mandy's question about going eco-friendly on a budget. Something that has worked well for me was identifying areas where it is realistic to make a switch and starting there. Some eco-friendly swaps can be more expensive, but there are others where the price point is parallel or even less expensive in the long run. The easiest place for me to start was making my own cleaning product after using up what I already had. With the help of some zero-waste blogs, I've learned how to make a lot of things myself, even as a busy student. The blogs I found the most helpful are GoingZeroWaste.com, AlmostZeroWaste.com, and Greenify-Me.com. The author of Greenify Me has a post specifically outlining free alternatives to the eco-friendly products we often see marketed. I want to make a note that making more eco-friendly choices is not about being perfect or even achieving quote-unquote zero waste. It's about making better more intentional decisions using the resources that we already have. All right, y'all, we'll see you on Patreon for the full maximal edition of episode 434 with Dr. Nicole LaPera, which includes answers to a bunch more questions. Questions like, how do I help my mom see that her relationship with my father is toxic? Should I end my seven-year relationship if my partner and I are no longer compatible? In what ways does unresolved trauma affect my current relationship? Plus a million more questions and simple living segments over on The Minimalist's private podcast. Visit patreon.com slash 
The Minimalists, or click the link down in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly Maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You also gain access to all of our podcast archives all the way back to episode 001. By the way, Patreon is now offering free trials. So if you'd like to test drive our private podcast, you can join for seven days for free. Big thanks to Dr. Nicole LaPera for joining us today. Her new book is called How to Be the Love You Seek. We'll put a link to this in the show notes. We're also going to put a link to all of her social media. It really started with her Instagram account, which is huge because of the observations and insights that she provides on a weekly basis. You've got to check that out. You can find her on social media. Also, her website. We'll put a link to that as well. That is our minimal episode for today. If you leave here with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. And as TK would say, peace. (laughs) (laughs) Love y'all. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it.